start the recording. Okay, everybody's coming in. I appreciate everybody coming in. The um, welcome to our to our next of our webinar series. This one on Tuesday, April twenty eighth. Uh, we're going to talk about um, a couple things that have been kind of focused by by some of the polls that we've been getting in is to continue to look at. Uh, ways of doing data analysis and helping helping the users get even more value out of uh, out of their data loggers, their AIM products. So, what we've uh, what we've chosen to do is bring in uh, another co-host that uh, is out there helping you know support folks and talking about different things. And and uh, and one of the topics that we've seen quite a bit in in emails and notes and stuff was uh, was friction circles and other X Y plots. So so that's where we're going to actually take a look at today with some more depth with Matt Romanowski from Trailbreak.com. So we'll uh, we'll introduce Matt in just a moment. We're uh, we're going to go ahead and get started though with uh, some quick introductions of some of the folks that are going to be answering your questions in in the Q and A box. If you don't have that open, go ahead and open that up now. And uh, of course, we have the chat where you guys can all chat amongst yourselves and chat to different people if you wish. But when you want to have a question asked during this webinar or answered uh, you know, in in some of the stuff that we do afterwards. Uh, if it's on the topic of friction circles and other X, Y plots, make sure you ask them in the question and answer box. We have uh, these, this great group of guys here that we're, uh, we're going to introduce in, qu in a quick second that are going to be answering those questions and then leaving some of those if they're really pertinent to what we're talking about uh, and, and we can handle them live, we'll be, uh, we'll be bringing those up. So any questions you have, make sure you bring them up into the, uh, the Q&A box. Okay. So with that, uh, let's, we're going to go around and take a quick introduction of some of those folks and what they do uh, here with AIM and uh, go around the room and we'll, we'll have them just give you just a little bit about themselves and, and uh, what they're going to do today. And then they're going to pop away and, and, uh, and get to work busy answering your questions. So we'll start with uh, Robbie over uh, down in California. Hey guys, um, just wanted to say it's been a pleasure doing these for you guys every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, I mean, I feel like everybody's uh, everybody is is enjoying them just as much as we're enjoying putting them on for you. So um, I've wor been working with the company for about ten years, uh, and I'm just here to answer any types of questions that you guys have. So if it's not on topic, we'll we'll get to you guys uh, via email and things like that, and just get all your questions answered. Perfect. Thank you very much, Robbie. Cameron over in Roanoke. Hey, everybody. Uh, Cameron, like Roger said, in Roanoke, um, we're we're here to uh, help you guys. Hopefully, learn something new today. And um, here we'll have the text answering all the you know, Q and A's. And like Robbie said, if it's anything off topic, we'd ha be happy to uh, help you afterwards um, through email. So happy to have you guys here, and um, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Robinson. How a little bit about you? Hey, hey guys, um, Robinson here, also work out of our Roanoke office. Uh, just don't hold the celebrity that Robbie and Cameron do yet. Um, <laughs> but I am, I am live from Central Command here in the office today. So just going to be dropping in to answer the Q&A and uh, hopefully assist you in your journey of uh, the learning acquisition here we got. Thank you very much, Robinson. Robinson's done this uh, with me in the, in the past, but I don't think at the uh, you know for the webinar ones like we've this been is, doing so far. It's so. my first webinar appearance here. Exactly. So he'll he'll do just great. Uh, Brick, a little bit about you. Hey guys, I am Brick. Uh, I'm also out of the Roanoke, Virginia office. I'm one of the techs there, and uh, going to be helping answer the questions some today as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, Brick. He's going to be here most uh, most of all the webinars we do in the in the future as well. And then we've got all the way from Milan. Uh, Emiliano has been helping us out quite a bit. Lots of good feedback. He's been answering questions in the Q and A as well. So, a uh, little bit about you, Emiliano. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm a software developer. I work for the company since uh, 20 years, and uh, I'm here to answer your question. Thanks uh, for having me here, and enjoy. Thank you very much, Emiliano. It's it's uh, Emiliano was even nice enough to say uh, good morning, but it's uh, it's the end of his day over there in uh, in in Italy. So, uh, very very pleased to have him here and uh, and putting in the uh, this effort to help us. It's uh, it's very very helpful. So, perfect. Uh, the uh, as we get started again, make sure you put your Q and A into your questions into the uh, into the question and answer box. We'll try to grab those as we. Uh, the ones that are that are uh, are being shown to us uh, as we as Matt and I talk about different things here with the uh, with X Y plots and um, and uh, but other than that we will have a panel at the end where we will we will try to bring a, together some that maybe we couldn't fit in into the live discussion and we'll we'll hit those that there there at the end but uh, for the most part we'll try to get uh, some of those answered as we go. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, is uh, start with a poll that. Um, 
the uh, just a it's very it's very very helpful to us. It's part of what is helping us uh, understand what we're doing as far as the topics that we go for. So we'll we'll do these polls like we have in, in previous webinars. The first one is is your your AIM devices. What what AIM Sports hardware do you own and use? And uh, in this particular case, it's a it's a select all that apply. You know, there's a multiple choice there. We did add for you the. Um, the ability, uh, we did not have Smarty Cam in there before. We're just running out of, you know, we only have so many spots for that. So I did add a Smarty Cam slash other there at the bottom. So make sure if, uh, if you do have a Smarty Cam, make sure you click on that one as well. We'll, we'll let that go for just a, a minute. If, uh, if you finish and you want to make sure you can see everything, just uh, click on your, uh, sh the submit button on, on your panel, it'll go away. I'm going to let that continue to go for just a little bit while Matt does a quick introduction of himself, and then we will we will jump into, uh, we'll finish the poll and then jump into Matt's presentation. So Matt, tell us a little bit about you. You've been around for quite a while. I know I've worked with you quite a bit on, uh, on a number of different pre uh, you know, processes that we've done. And, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of our AIM dealers, uh, one of a, a, a group of, a large group of AIM dealers that uh, you know, strongly support the products out at the track and with email and support. And uh, so we appreciate Matt doing what he does. Give us a little bit about your background as well, Matt. Yeah, so my, my quick background here is uh, my name is Matt Romanowski. I run trailbreak.com. I also have trailbreak.net. Um, .net's more information. .com is to buy things and all that. Uh, I got my start with AIM products about 20 years ago in a SCCA form in the Continental. Uh, we had a Micron 3, I think it was a gold with a, a dash display on it. And I got into data there and then just kept using it more and more through a series of Porsches. Um, and then building my track car, I have uh, everything in it. And I try to use all the products, um, be super conversational and in depth with all the software. And then uh, my philosophy is to really support people and help them get out there and use all the products, whatever it is. And that's kind of between what everyone was suggesting for the seminars and um, this mix of products that we have, everyone's voting on right now. I like to do things that work for everyone. And I think one of the cool things about what we're going to do today is that it works on any of the devices listed in this um, poll that people are taking right now and so many of the old products as well. Perfect. Perfect. I, I appreciate that, Matt. The um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll uh, for, for now and, and be ready. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, We'll have another poll after uh, after Matt talks about friction circles just a little bit, but uh, but I appreciate everybody doing that. And and uh, just before I go to Matt for his presentation, the uh, I'd like to again welcome everybody here. I know it's uh, tough times, and we're you know many of us are are are, are stuck in uh, places maybe we don't want to be as much. We'd rather be out at the racetrack and and uh, and having fun. Uh, you and all of us that are uh, here from AIM is, is that have the same thoughts. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, you know learning to get a little bit more. Uh, added value out of your AIM products. It's a, it's, it's a great thing and, uh, and we're gonna continue to do these for quite some time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share over to Race Studio 2 where we, where we will start to start the process of talking about uh, some of the stuff that Matt, you know, some of the, just the tools that Matt uses and, and teaches uh, some ways, different ways that of using this particular function in, in the AIM data. Like he mentioned, it was, is uh, for the most part, he's gonna talk about uh, you know, GPS-based accelerometer data, or or you know, at least a function of that, or or some pretty basic you know, sensor-based data. So there'll be uh, lots of lots of things here, I think, for everybody to to take a look at. What I'm going to do now is uh, we're showing you the Race Studio 2. I'm going to give Matt the uh, remote control on the mouse, and uh, he should have that now. Matt, if you go ahead and click on there, and then we should be able to go ahead and start looking at our first one, which is a which is a friction circle or a GG sum GG diagram. Some people call it different things, but using our XY plot function. Yeah. So I wanted to start here. And I think this is a great example to show people of the idea of profiles that this is the kind of screen I really like to look at where I have um, up here on the top, you can see that we have our speed trace and um, the actual point. You can see I'll bring the, the indicator in there to show you the point we're looking at on the track. We can see it on the map over here. Um, and that's the GPS driven map. So now we have some context to our data. We're not looking at something completely blank in everything. Um, so this is where I really like to start. And what we're looking at on the main screen here in the middle is our GG plot. And really it's a XY graph. We're gonna graph two things versus each other. So here on the vertical scale on the left, we have our um, 
longitudinal acceleration. And that is the front back. When you hit the gas, right, you go back in your seat, that is the positive acceleration. When you hit the brakes and you feel it really push you into the belts and you're, you're going forward, that's your negative acceleration. And you'll see, um, if we just look at the halves, right, the top to the bottom, above zero is our acceleration. That's always limited by your horsepower, your grip. Um, I would love to be able to drive the car that had that, you know, 1G acceleration. <laughs> that'd be really fun. Um, you know, that'd be a dragster or something, right? Or a, a, some sort of car like that. The negative Gs, what we see down here going down in this example to just about 1.2 is our braking. We hit the brakes, we go forward, and that's how hard we can slow the car down. And then the left and right, that's lateral sideways um, acceleration of your uh, football fan, that's your left and right. Um, and that's when we turn the wheel, right? We turn and we go. So just like you would sort of think, left hand turns, go to the left, right hand turns, go to the right. Um, so that's the idea of how this XY scatter plot works and what we're looking at in general. One um, of the things, Matt, that, uh, that, that some people, it helps them understand as well, there is a convention in motorsports that, that right-hand corners are positive on the on, on lateral Gs and left-hand corners are, are, are negative and braking is negative and, and acceleration is positive. And we just follow that same thing in our in our XY plot. So that's uh, always, even when you're looking at the squiggly lines, it's it's good to understand that if, boy, if a uh, lateral G is in the negative, it's a left-hand corner. So that's, yeah. a, that's a, we follow those normal conventions. Right. And... Um, so when we bring up this idea of the friction circle, what we really have is something that Mark Donahue put out um, a long time ago. And you can read about it in his book, The Unfair Advantage. And he says, the way we get the most grip out of the tire and the way we make the fastest laps is to use all that grip. And it's not just a brake and off the brake and then turn. It's how do we blend those things together? Um, and I was thinking about this and I said, geez, it's really that idea of the fuzzy dice or um, where you hit the brakes and they swing forward, right? And that's when they swing forward on the brakes is when they go down here. And when you hit the gas and they come back towards you, that's this point up at the top. Um, and then when you turn, obviously it's the left and right. Those are the things we're really kind of looking at here. Uh, and Mark Donahue brought that together and he said, if we can work all those edges, then we do better. Um, it's something you can read more about that idea. It's talked about in a lot of the car clubs. Um, I'm sure a Google search would turn up a ton of info about it if you really want to get more in depth there. And we're going to have some really great info in the next seminar with Jeremy. Um, hopefully I'm not giving away too many secrets, <laughs> but uh, you'll have some really great info coming in there. And really the art of being fast is combining that longitudinal and the um, lateral acceleration. And when we blend those things two together, that's what's really going to get us to be quick. Um, so that's the idea of what we're looking at here, kind of in a theory. The way we would set this up to get you started is up here in the top left, and I'm going to highlight that point again, we have a little graph that has an XY in the, the detail. When you click that, you're going to get a graph like this. The way we set this up is we want our lateral left to right movements, and we set that up with this wrench icon up here. And when we go in here, we're gonna get this list and it tells us horizontal axis channel, Y axis, right? That's the left to right channel. And um, this is a spot, I saw some questions about this and um, it's one that you can use the GPS, which is what I always kind of defer to, to use these GPS accelerometers. The AIM hardware and software does a really terrific job of getting that information as precise as possible. And we're gonna see a way that it does that in a little bit. Um, but it also doesn't require any calibration, so it's always accurate. You didn't forget to do it or something was wrong with it. Um, it accounts for track camber changes. Um, if you drive on a track, like the great example I was talking to someone the other day about was Daytona. Um, when you have all that banking in the corners, it throws off the actual acceleration, so you have to do some math to make those numbers good. This way, with the GPS, it's right on. Um, takes a lot of extra work out of it. So I always use the GPS. You could use the actual accelerometer. The basic graph data is gonna be the same. One might be a little more noisy, 
Um, and this is also a spot that we get to configure um, how we want this information to look. And we can do it with lines, with dots, or with circles. Um, most of the time, I prefer the dots, but the information is the same. It's really how it looks to you and what you like to see in your data. So for me, I like a kind of a size two or three dot. You might like a line. The information doesn't actually change. So we come in here and we would pick our lateral acceleration, our dot or your line or your circles, and then we would say apply and exit. And I'm just gonna um, exit so we don't change anything in this one that we have good because I was clicking around in there. And then um, our vertical axis, that is our Y axis that you see over here, which is the back and forth is the longitudinal acceleration. We're gonna pick GPS longitudinal acceleration. Um, one of the little gotchas that gets people here on occasion is they won't have this scale. And the way we make sure we have that scale is the checkbox next to GPS longitudinal acceleration. And if we turn that off, we lose the scale. And what we really care about in an XY plot like this is the general shape. We don't necessarily care about the exact numbers, but it's nice to have a little bit of a reference um, because we know a lot of cars, a car on street tires is probably gonna break at about one G. Uh, a car on some track tires is probably gonna be 1.2. If you had some pretty trick tires or a, a different setup, you might see 1.3 or 4. If you had a car with aerodynamics, it might be even more than that. So it's good to have a little bit of scale there to, to know kind of how things go. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of what we're looking. And hopefully that makes some sense with how you set up this graph and what we have going. Um, and then along the idea of what's in this, um, the graph and how big the numbers end up is all this data is actually my driving. Um, the track is Watkins Glen that you see. And uh, I like to joke, I have an old Porsche 914 with a three liter six out of a 911, um, pretty stock. It, these are my numbers. They're, some of the data looks better than others. Some of it doesn't look too pretty, but um, I think it's important to put your data up there and see it so that people in, in yourself sees what you did because it's not a tattletale or uh, anything else like that. It's not trying to get you in trouble or anything. What it's doing is just recording what you did so that you can see what you did and then um, work to improve it. So I always yeah. kind of like to think of the business process of kind of plan, um, do, review. So yeah, I, Jer Jeremy talked about that a little bit yesterday in, uh, in a previous webinar where, where he chatted about uh, it, it, it's data, right? It's it's not a yep. tattletale. It, it is just giving you information about what happened and ways that uh, you can use that to either make yourself better or if you're sharing with somebody else to find spots in the track where you you were better or they were better and and, and figure that out. The um, there one of the thing one of the questions I saw is any way to put the stored profile in a, in the display somewhere. You know, I'll I'll take that and kind of wrap that back around. Is is this is maybe the way that Matt likes to look at it. Maybe it's something that you may want to, to set up yourself. We did an entire webinar on the user interface and setting things up previous, you know, take a look at that. Maybe Robbie can link that into the, into the chat box where we talked about manipulating the, um, the screen to put it where you want it. And once you get there, and we talked about this in a couple of webinars previously, Matt, I'm going to grab your mouse for just a second. Yeah. You can come up to, uh, and you're going to see that Matt's going to use some of these. What we've done is once we get this thing set up by minimizing, you know, using the restore down commands and then resizing these exactly where we want them. And then we just saved it and we called it Matt's friction circle. And then uh, Matt's going to use these, these, uh, user profiles in a minute to go to the next one. So absolutely, we take a look at these, uh, these things and we can actually uh, save that view. The other one that gets asked a lot with these, Matt, and you might have been, you might be heading towards covering it, but you went to, uh, we scaled both of these at, I think, 1.7 or something, uh, 1.7 laterally and 1.7 yeah. both ways on the, on the, on the y-axis. And that's, that's just to make it square, right? And make it so you're, you're, you're seeing something that uh, has that same exact values like you mentioned. But what the one thing that, you know, it, it still looks like it's stretched wider than it is tall. And that's because of just the reference of the size of the window. So if we start to resize this window now if we were to make this x the y-axis the same width as the x-axis now now you would have a truly visual square value right but but uh, that's not always 
doable on, on monitors and it's probably not that easy. So we, we tend to go ahead and go ahead and widen it. Though, even though the numbers are, we're scaling at the same, the, the visual of it just because of the way that we size the window. So I, 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 I did see that question kind of go by and, and I just wanted to go over that real briefly. Yeah, okay. and that's an important point. And um, one of the ways I like to kind of think about that is we have our grids turned on and when we look at it, we don't have a square in the background. It's not like a perfect piece of graph paper. It's a, a rectangle. So like Roger said, we can go in here and we can try to resize this to where we see that get a little bit better. And, and we make the differences um, in these numbers kind of the same across. Um, it, it, it's a good way. And I think kind of going back to the idea that using your data as a way to improve, sometimes it's we're not using it to the point that it's uh, perfection causes us more problems, right? We want to always improve and work towards that, but we don't need to have it minute perfect to yeah. get to that point. Yeah. And we, uh, we end up with right now we're to, to start off the process. Matt is just giving you your one lap of one car, right? So yep. uh, uh, yes, we can, we could add another lap if we wanted to, if, for those, uh, we can add even a second, friction circle onto the screen if we wanted to. And, I, and the only reason I bring it up now is uh, oh, the last thing that Matt's going to show us is actually going to have multiple friction circles for, for different things. And, uh, and in the normal settings, you can't do that. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a special setting, you know, enabling multiple worksheets in your AIM software. If you want to do that, get back with us and we'll, and, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you understand how that one works and we'll do a, a future webinar on it. But we've got in, uh, multiple worksheets enabled right now, which does a couple things. We can put multiple friction circles, multiple measures graphs if we wanted to. And the other thing that you might be seeing if you're looking at this that, uh, that uh, might confuse you is down here at the bottom, we've actually got, you know, we've got a speed only trace down here at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen that that tab this is what we're calling it speed only you can see up here you can't rename them unless you're in that multiple graphs window that multiple worksheet so uh, so if you see that don't let that confuse you it's a uh, it's just a function of having that multiple set up so Matt will take back over and, uh, and and continue on wherever he wants to go yeah and one of the questions I saw is um, somebody asked with the only accelerating at 0.3 G's um, <laughs> it's a 914 it doesn't have it's maybe 2,000 pounds, 200 horsepower, not a real fast car. Um, and also some of that is a lap at Watkins Glen. You don't have those really slow corners that you're going to get the bigger acceleration out of. Um, you know, if the slowest corner is 60 something miles an hour, your, your acceleration is always going to look a little bit lower versus a, a track where you have a really slow corner. Um, exactly. One that comes to my mind, like Montremblant with a corner like Namro, it's a 32 mile an hour corner that you're down to first gear, you're gonna accelerate out of there really hard. And you're gonna see up here, out of the center of the graph, um, the acceleration is gonna be a lot higher. Perfect. So, um, gives you an idea there. One of the other questions I saw before, somebody asked about, um, does the actual accelerometer data give you what the tire feels versus the GPS? The numbers end up being the same. The actual accelerometer data, depending on where you mounted it in the car, maybe a little bit noisier or not, but it's really the um, speed and time around a radius that gives you the G-force, not uh, on the tire. And one of the questions was, where's the best place to mount that accelerometer? Really the best place is the center gravity of the car, if you can find that point. Um, and if you can mount it there. In practice, it's almost never there unless you're doing some special testing. Most of the time it's in the display, on your dashboard and the difference is negligible. You'd, you'd be able to see it kind of in between the GPS measure and the um, actual dash measure with the accelerometers. Yeah, exactly. So the, why so many data points? The, the, these data points are representing every 10th of a second what, where that car was in time and distance. And then we, we, we record that. And every 10th of a second is one of these dots. And we do filter some out. And Matt will show you a little bit later where he zooms in. We'll, we'll actually see it, uh, that filtering happen. But that's what's creating those dots. They are in one spot. You can tell by where he's got the cursor up here, right here at the tip top. And then, uh, and then you'll see the cursor is actually in the in the xy plot and it's in the gps map so that spot we're in and in, in this it's all dynamically linked so as he moves around you'll see if, if i just move it back here you know get into a corner you'll see now that's way over here you know, heavy duty left hand corner right at the apex of the you know the 
V min or the minimum speed, and he's right there entering the bus stop. So that gives you an idea. It's it's one dot per tenth of a second, and that's because that's our GPS sampling rate. Yep. So um, to jump into kind of how we read this graph a little bit is when we think about our driving, and this is kind of how I think, because I think as a driver, not just the the data part, is I come up to a corner, I hit the brakes, I start to release the brakes, and I start to turn the wheel in and I try to smoothly blend all of that together. Um, so one of the really cool things in the AIM software is everything's linked. So when we click a point on our speed graph, and this is, I always like that the speed graph up because that's ultimately what figures out how we did. Um, we see the point here where I clicked. We see the point on the track, and it's a little bit tougher to see here. We can see the cross point in the data where that actually is. And now as we zoom in, we start to see the data as it relates just to those points. So this is still coming into turn one at Watkins Glen, and we can see our speed trace, and we can see that point in the data. And as we click a point and we move along, we see exactly what happened. Um, and to Roger's point, and the question I was asked before, all the points is, the further we zoom into a graph, the more we're gonna see the dots in the graph change a little bit because it keeps adding some of those that it had filtered out just for the display part of it. Um, and if we continue to zoom in far enough, we'd see them at each 10th of a second. Uh, not something that we usually need to get that in because we can look at this here and see exactly what I did as I went into turn one and see how we can improve it. So if we take a look at that, we can see I was accelerating in and we know it's accelerating for two reasons. It's a, the speed trace is still going up if, as we look up here in the speed trace. And we can see the point in the friction circle is still above the zero, right? We're above zero, so we're accelerating. As we approach the corner, we start, I started hitting the brake and I was slowing down. And you can see as I kept decelerating, and I actually brought the car to the left a little bit. And if you know Watkins Glen really well, um, the break point as you're going down there, there's a flagger. So I brought the car over some position. And um, as we zoom in on our map, we're gonna get a little messed up before. We'll, we'll see if we can see that. And you can see this line isn't really quite straight. And it has that little bend in it where I started to bring the car left. Um, and then as I continued driving in here, I released the brake some and then started to turn it the rest of the way. Uh, this point here where you see this little loop, it's not a real Swedish flick, but that's the idea where I brought it in and I turned left and then I went to the right. Um, really that corner, the, the better way to do it and the better way for most corners is to bring the car in straight and then make your turn in. Um, so that gives me a spot I could certainly improve on this lap what I did there. Um, the other thing that we see is this distance change between my maximum braking down here at say 1.15 and where I turned in at about 0.8. So I was on the brakes, I released the brake pedal a little bit and then I turned. And in a perfect world and you know the guys who make money to drive, not just people like me that pay money to drive. Um, these two blend right together. Um, and that's why I said that's the art of really going fast is how do you put those two things together and blend them? That's the goal we take away from almost every corner entry is how to do that. Um, one of the questions I just saw, and it, it's a really great one, is it said, hey, I'm having a little trouble seeing this point. And normally me, we can hop me, in. Yeah. I can change that color, maybe may in a different way, but you can make it yeah. bigger by doing that. We can make our, our we're just gonna go full big to give you kind of a big reference. We say apply and exit. And now <laughs> we can go. see, we get those really big lines, right? And if people that's think that's, that's a little better, we can leave it this way to, to help them out where that is. Yeah, yeah, um, that'll work. Now start drag, dragging it back and forth in the GPS, uh, in, the, in the speed trace and, and let's show them how that moves now. Right, so as I approach this corner, I'm accelerating in, and we can there see it's go. above zero. Accelerate, accelerate, and then I hit the brakes, right? I get the whoa pedal, the one in the middle, and it starts to really slow down. I turn the wheel a little bit to the left, and then 
about here I start my turning. So I was break, 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 and then I came off, and then I started a turn instead of really blending it together. Um, turn one at the Glen is a really great spot to look for this because if we zoom back out of this view, we see, and we come back here, we take a look at Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen is a, a wonderful track, really, really fun to drive. And you have an acceleration zone from about where am I, well, about this apex, right where I'm clicked now, all the way up the back straight to what they call the bus stop. Um, critical spot to really make time at this track. Very, very important. Can be a challenge in some cars, can be a psychological challenge because it's really hard. And um, a kind of neat thing about it, it has two corners that you really try to roll speed through. The first one turned one that we looked at and the next one is down here at the bus stop. Um, one of the things that I use in the software a lot and I find it really helps me to be able to, and I saw a question about this earlier, was how do we know where we are on the map and where we are in the data? So we can click in the speed trace, but sometimes it's hard to know where that speed is if you don't really know what the software or uh, what the track profile looks like for the speed. But what's really cool about it, we can click in our GPS map and go to a point, and now we know we're at the entrance to the bus stop, and here's our data point. So if we wanna zoom in, we zoom in, we start to see how it changes our data in the XY plot and our friction circle to match up to the speed trace. And as we keep coming in here, we keep getting down to the data for that corner. And we're gonna zoom in a little bit more even. So now we really have it focused in. So here's the back straight and the bus stop. And we see our speed trace, the same idea again. And we can see that uh, I did even a worse job we really see my tendencies in my driving coming out. Um, I accelerated, I accelerated, I accelerated. And we see that up here in the speed trace. We see it here where I'm accelerating. I start to break. We see that coming down where our big crosshair is hitting. And then what did I do? I started to turn the wheel left. So for some reason in this session, I wasn't following the edge of the track. I was way off it maybe a car length, maybe more. It'd be another thing to investigate, maybe pull up my Smarty Cam video and jump into that and see where I was on the track. Um, so we see that I have this tendency now, right? This is something that me as a coach, me as a driver, I write down and I go turning it the wrong way at the braking, right? I make some note that makes sense to me. Um, so I, another great question here, how did I zoom? So the way I like to zoom is I use the scroll wheel on my mouse. As you slide it forward, it zooms into a point. As you um, roll backwards, it zooms out. The other great way you can do it is to use your zoom tools up here. Um, I'm really kind of a mouse guy. I work on the mouse control a little bit more than I do on the, um, the, the hot keys or the, the buttons sometimes but it, it's really kind of how you get used to the software. Roger and I have talked a lot. He likes to use hotkeys a little bit more than I do. I think I have one that I use commonly. Um, so it gives you some points there. Um, another great question I just saw about was the loops, right? These, my bad loops, kind of we see part of one here and we see one here. So as we talk about the data and we think about what the car was doing, I was, breaking, and this is this point here. As we come down, I'm breaking through this zone, and then it goes to the left because I started to turn the car left while I was braking, and then I turn to the right. And this is the part that gets a little bit tricky, and sometimes it's hard to, to wrap your head around a little bit. As I was turning in, I started to turn less. So I was turning, and then I was, I still had, if we look in here, I was always around 0.2 to 0.3 Gs, right? So a small turn, turning, and then I turned a little bit less, but still turning, and then turned more again. So that explains our left to right in here. Why does it go up and down in that loop? Well, the up and down is I got on the brakes a little bit more. So I was braking. I hit the brakes a little bit more, and we see that even in the slope right here, that the slope changes. And I'm gonna, um, another trick that I really like to do is that when you double click your measures 
on the left, it zooms in and it fits your screen right to those points. When we look right here, I'm gonna move the cursor off it, see the slope changes, it's not constant. And that tells us that there was a change in the amount of braking because it changed the speed. So I was braking, I let off the brake a little bit and we see the slope flatten out a little bit. And then when I got back on the brake more, it, and we see this loop happening, I hit the brake some more. So I wasn't smooth on my brake. Um, if we were to dig in a little bit more, this is one of the spots where in one of the earlier sessions, James talked about data being like an onion. This is where I might jump in and look at a brake trace or a throttle trace and see was this maybe sloppy heel toe shifting um, or was it maybe I got scared and I hit the brake some more, um, something like that. So yeah, when I, when I see the, the curly cue like that, uh, when, when the brake and the turn happens at the same time, it, 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 it's pointing me the what happened, where it happened, why it happened, or the peeling of the onion, uh, to almost think of that it was, uh, that it was when you downshifted it is, is, is pretty typical when I see yeah. that. So Yeah, and that's, that's usually my thought, and I would go downshift. But I also try to investigate a little bit into Certainly. it and say, like, you know, is my first guess here right? Yeah, um, one of the the way that yeah, as we get ready to move on to an, another trace, bringing up the the um, the the RPM, you know, it, you could see that bringing up the you know the the throttle position. You can see it actually happened. You know, a, 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 yeah, you know what? It's 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 pretty darn close to. It's right yeah. after it. It's it almost, almost like you were setting your body up to do the uh, to do the the, the blip, right? So yeah, uh, it, interesting nonetheless. It just uh, that you know that whole peeling of the onion. Understand why it happened. If you don't understand what why it happened, it's hard to to use these tools to to improve. Right, and um, you know, a, a great part of that too is you go. So now when we talk about our plan, do review, and how we make ourselves a better driver, this is a really good spot to jump in here and say, geez, maybe my heel and toe is bad, right? So now you have a spot to go back and review a little bit more and take a look at all those downshifts and go, am I doing a good job heel and toe downshifting? Because maybe it's something that I'm normally good at, but I wasn't focusing on. Um, I was working with a driver and for them it was upshift, something we never had trouble with, all of a sudden one day we did. So exactly. a chance to dig into things. Um, exactly. So here we, we really see that. And uh, one of the other questions I saw here was, um, is my car kind of soft where it takes a moment to get that set? The car's really stiff. This was just uh, maybe not my best performance, but a chance to see some, some real data. Um, as a car goes, my car's really, really stiff to the point that uh, when I'd like to take it for a ride around the neighborhood, I can't because it, it just bounces the heck out of you. Um, I, I love it that the question comes up though from from Greg. It's it's it is it is exactly what you do with data. You you see something and then you immediately go into to why did it happen? Uh, unpeeling the onion or my statement always is what happened, where did it happen, why did it happen? So uh, yeah. very good, Greg. It, you're you're picking up on the the next steps, obviously. Right, and I I saw a question just pop up here from AJ, and he said, "Can you do all this with the GSUM? Completely, you can do it." And I hope you tune in on Thursday because Jeremy's going to go right down that road and say, same kind of information, different view, different way to look at it, but you're gonna come to the same conclusion. Um, and sort of like my idea of circles versus dots or lines, which one makes sense to you? Try them all, see which one connects to you really well, and then go from there. Um, okay. And let's finish out this corner a little bit here before we jump into the next part. And, uh, as we look at this and we, we come in, we see I kept slowing, right? I did my little brake turn loop, probably a poor heel toe downshift. I kept turning in. And now when we get up here, we see I'm almost ready to start accelerating. And here's where um, I get back to kind of neutral, right? I'm not on the gas, I'm not on the brake, smooth. And then it slows down a little bit as I enter the rest of the bus stop. Um, so this kind of gives you the idea of how we can dig into a section of data and really pick a corner and say, I'm going to focus on my entry to turn one, my entry to the bus stop, maybe the entrance to the toe and see what's there. Um, as we talk about the toe, something that I like to look at, and it goes along with the idea of somebody asked a question about, could you turn on multiple laps? You can turn on lots of laps and you can, you get this really big kind of cluster graph and you get all these points. And sometimes it's good to look at an outlier. One of the spots we see an outlier in this data is 
down at these points. Um, and we can cycle through our graph and see when we end up out there. And I'm gonna help us cheat to find that point and move down pretty quick. That's scrolling through that. He, he mentioned the toe a couple of times. That's not an, uh, that's not an aim thing. That's a, a corner in the, at Watkins Glen. Yes, so uh, <laughs> Watkins Glen, much like Italy, where our friend Emiliano is, has uh, a part of it, and it's this part down here that kind of looks like a foot. And we joke, Italy looks like a boot. Um, so the toe of the boot is this point. And in yeah, here, as we look at it, we see, we get these points way out here. And we say, what's going on? Like, why are those so much different than what we see in the rest of this graph? Yeah, outside and, the norm. Right, really outside the norm. We can zoom in here and say, hey, what's going on? And as we see this, we look at it and if we want to turn on another channel one of the cool things that we're going to see that relates back to one of our previous sessions was the slope really changed um the earlier session with james clay from bimmer world talked about the slope of things we really see that in the graph here that the slope really comes up the track rises up to meet us and the car makes more grip and Physical we see grip. that in the graph um, Another really quick trick before we move on that I really like to do is if we double uh, or if we double right click on our GPS map, it'll make it 3D. We see this box show up and then we can click and drag it with our right button and we get this great 3D image. And in here, we can now see how much this track changes and how much this slope comes up as we come through that point. Um, James talked about it as a really great description as a 3D driver. It, it really brings that point home so that we can see um, exactly what we're looking at in the data. The one gonna, far, far left, there you go. Right, there we go. I always end up clicking through all the view yeah, buttons me, at me the too, top. Me too, me what too. I want. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go back to a whole lap here and I, and I hope this gives people a really great explanation of an XY plot, the friction circle, and how we can dive into all this to look at it. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, if people have done this before, but it's really a great job to see what you're doing with the brake, how you're blending your braking and into your cornering. Um, it's a very visual way. It doesn't take any math. It's a few clicks. You can save it as a profile and it works really great. Perfect. One, one last question before we, we, we start up another poll. One of the, we talked about dynamically linked the, um, you know, the software. I, I'm clicking up here in the, in the measures graph and, uh, and I can click anywhere and the cursors in all the other three jump to that same exact point. We can do that in the GPS map as well. I can click here and it jumps to there and it jumps to that, uh, that X in, in here. What the software will not allow us to do is like, and that's why Matt drug across to find it. We can't just come over and click on that dot in the in the X Y plot and have it jump to it. it, it it's an enhancement that will uh, that I'm confident we will see in Race Studio three analysis. But right now, this is one you cannot pick a certain dot and have it jump. So you end up coming over here and and uh, and, and dragging around until that dot gets uh, you know gets uh, gets highlighted it because of that. So can't click on the uh, dots in that one individual one over there. So. Yep. Okay. Uh, Matt, while you're uh, finishing up a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and start up a, a second poll. And, uh, and we call this our experience level poll. It, it, again, it helps us uh, with, uh, with a ton of information as far as uh, where we go and what we're, what we're doing with these, with these webinars. So this one has changed just a little bit. If you've been here at previous webinars, uh, the, the question's slightly different. How much experience do you have using data acquisition hardware and software? What we've done is we pulled the AIM side of it out and and uh and again it's 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 not you know you're not counting up the actual time but just a, a general idea of how much experience you have using all forms of data just the understanding of 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 data analysis and and, and software so uh go ahead and fill that out matt do you have uh, anything you want to close up with on this one as uh, as folks are finishing that one up yeah real a real quick one is um somebody asked is there an example of where a loop is good as we come in that we break and maybe we turn one way and go the other um in general, and, and this is a big general, is no, they're not good. The exception to that would be 
if there's a feature in the track that we need to get to a part that's cambered, or if maybe as we're coming up to a break zone, sometimes they add you some pavement on the entry to the corner and you can make use of that extra radius. If you have something like that, it's a good chance to use it and you'll see maybe that loop in there. But really more than the loop, what we would prefer is a side turn and not the, um, the loop where we're on the break and back off. We'd like smooth break and then off completely and smooth yeah. turn. Exactly. So not really a loop, but more of a pure, uh, maybe a little turn and then a wiggle. Yeah, the analogy being that you're loading up that tire. It's like it's the, where the rubber meets the road, right? You're loading up the tire, and if you ever release it and then go again, you, you've had to had to get to that that stiction point again, right? So uh, right. anytime that you can load it up and hold a nice constant steady, that you're going to be able to rise raise that rate of of what you, what the contact patch can actually give you. So yeah, perfect. And uh, um, another question before we kind of jump into the next part here is someone asked the general shape. Um, the shape is different for every track. And sometimes even inside a track, it's a little different per car. Um, obviously, if we have a car with uh, no aerodynamic grip and a lot of aerodynamic grip, they're gonna be pretty different. Um, if they are similar cars, same track, they're gonna be pretty similar. You get a track like Lime Rock, right? Turn right until you're really bored, make one left, keep doing rights until you get really bored. That's a track where you're going to see it really skewed to one side. Um, a track like Daytona, totally skewed, right? Because you have all these big corners one way. Um, so it, it's a little bit individualistic to the track. Uh, Perfect. Absolutely. Okay, let me end that poll. Uh, thank you all for doing that. I'm going to end the poll and then I'm going to I'm going to share the the experience level that you uh, that, that some of you might be um, wondering what what the rest of the group is. The uh, the, the the one to two years has been has been top of the list here probably for for most of our most of our webinars and and the zero to two years has been the been been the bulk so we're 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 trying to find some ways and Matt's going to give you a couple of uh, uh, XY plots here in just a moment that, that go into more advanced uses of the of the feature but we're always trying to make sure we try to balance this out between these uh, these 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 zero to two year uh, newer users to the software and, and just trying to learn and, 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 and up their game as well as the the, the guys that are uh, you know that uh, that 25 percent that are between five five and ten years of experience in, in data in data generally so Okay, I'm going to stop sharing those results to get those out of the way, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull this this trace out of here, and let's add your second your next one, Matt. We're going to go to yeah. uh, uh, understeer oversteer. I'll I'll bring it up for you just to make it easy on you. Perfect. Uh, and then put that up there, and then give you give you the mouse. So uh, we're looking at not only friction circles, but what other ways to use the uh, X Y plots. Uh, the the longer I use data. And the longer I do uh, data analysis, the more I like X, Y plots. There's such a trending way of looking at data. So, if, uh, so Matt's going to show a couple more ways of, uh, of using these plots that most people just use for a friction circle. But, but uh, there are other cool ways of doing it as well. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so our friction circle is the most popular. But then if we have a steering channel, so we know when we turned, this is a great way to help evaluate the car. And besides an engineering perspective of how do we make the car better, I really like to use this as a tool to make the driver better. So the driver can look at this data and say, get out of the car, make their notes and say, I don't think the car was understeering or I don't think I had any oversteer. And then jump into this graph to look at it and say, um, is this, was the car doing that? What's the data say? And kind of use it as a way to calibrate your butt. Um, we joke about the, the butt dyno and, and how we calibrate that. So what this graph is, is again, longitudinal acceleration on the, x-axis left to right here and on the vertical axis now we have steering input and this isn't a super precise way it's not a mathematical way it just tells us for every bit of turning the wheel did the car build more g-force and what we see in that is um, as we turn the wheel more and it, it increases from zero up to a point of 70 in this one is 70 degrees, did the G-force keep building? And if it kept building, then there's a direct link because that's really what an XY graph shows us. And if the G-force didn't keep building, then we know we have understeer. So we see this one in the center straight, 
the car doesn't make any g-force, right? That's what we expect. The wheel's straight, no left to right g-forces. As we start turning, the car builds g-force, and we see the width of the line, the scatter of it, builds as it comes out. And in that build is really where we see maybe some understeer start, a little bit here. And we could say almost down here where we have the same amount, 30 degrees of steering, we get a little bit less acceleration to the side, and maybe there's some oversteer. The ones that really stick out to me are these points down here. <laughs> and we say these were definitely an oversteer moment. That's where the wheel went the other way, right? We got opposite lock on the car and it still started to go, right? We're steering into that skin. Um, those are those kind of points where we can dig into that and look. And um, it's another spot where we can say, was this a one-time thing? We can peel that onion. Do we, was it a one-time thing? Was it driver induced? Maybe you were at a sloppy downshift. Maybe uh, you turned the wheel too quick. There was something else going on. Or um, maybe it was uh, just the track conditions or something else. Another chance if you have the video, jump into the video um, and see what was going on. Maybe it was an oil spill. Maybe it was something else. Um, great chance to, to take just the data part of it and jump into the video and say, what caused this? What did we see? Why did it go on? Um, a uh, the, the, you know, looking at it in this way, again, I just want to talk about the normal conventions. Uh, when, you, when you set up your steering in the same, you know, in, a, in the normal convention, which is steering wheel angle, if you're doing it angles or if you're doing spindle angles, whatever. But it, when you turn left, it should be a negative number and that in that creates your negative you know g so you end up with a, a very consistent way of looking at these if you if you were to set your steering sensor and, ha and have it where when you turn right it it gives you negative numbers this whole thing would just be tipped the other way right so it's yep. it's just good to uh, understand that uh, the, the the normal conventions are are make this a very uh, very easy to read diagram Right, and uh, somebody asked a question, can we turn on some laps and see if this is a, a trend or what? And we can do that. We can come down and we can click. We can say, if we turn on some laps here, what do we see? The only dots down here, it was kind of a one lap thing. It looks like this far out. And maybe we have some green dots right here. Um, so maybe this car tends to oversteer just a little bit. Um, I also like to use this graph as a way to kind of evaluate is the car numb is it responsive when you turn the wheel does it really go where you want or does it take a while to do something and then go um, when the car's numb you'll see the spread get really big this one's pretty tight for a car um, you'll see some of them get really really wide and it, it gives you an idea is this car really doing what the person wants or is one input maybe giving them all different g levels and that's really the idea of what we get out of this graph yeah. And you can see that in steering box, you know, speed, you can see that in how much, you know, um, camber and, and, and uh, in the toe settings, you can see when you, when you deaden it up early on to try to, to get around other problems. So kind of yeah. interesting. I really, uh, I really do like the oversteer, understeer XY plots. Yeah. And a, a last question somebody asked here on this one is, does it require special sensors? The horizontal is accelerometer, whether it's you use the actual accelerometer or you use the GPS. Um, again, here we're using GPS. It's always accurate. It's always calibrated. Um, but you do need a steering sensor. A lot of the newer cars with the thousands of um, CAN profiles that we have in AIM, they get it. Um, older cars are like my 914. I have a sensor on everything. So I have a string pod attached to my steering column to get it. Um, there's a bunch of ways you can add that steering sensor if it's something you wanted. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I'm going to start with another poll as as we kind of start to wrap up at the end of this one. The um, the the other one that, that we'd like to understand with folks is is a little bit of what what type of motorsports are you doing? We're uh, we are uh, you can go ahead and do that one, and and you can do multiple choices there on on that particular poll. What's um what's interesting is we've been getting feedback from folks, and we're actively trying to line up. Um, uh, you know, folks that are really good with their data in in different forms of motorsports. We've been we've been you know, working a lot with with uh, you know sports cars or road racing ki kind of data in in uh, in automobiles and and just because the 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 
you know, and I'll and I'm going to share this with you in just a moment. The, this this uh, poll that we're running through, but uh, it, it'll uh, you know the, uh, the mass number of people that we have here are doing that. So, but with uh, that said, we've have uh, you know, we want to try to get uh, you know some different views and, and different things. In the end, data is is it's not data is data, but it's but it's pretty close. A lot of the functions we talk about here work in uh, you know the uh, the uh, the, the friction circle one we talked about it, it works you know pretty darn well with motorcycles and you know, and other forms and even um, you know even oval track racing and some other things you, the friction circle is is just the load of the tires and, and opening your hands back up so so uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and end that polling it's uh, the numbers are about where we've been seeing let me end that polling and let me share that with you just to give you an idea of of uh, of who's out here and watching right now where you know again the what what we have turned there is auto racing that's that's pretty much road racing is if you look at the other choices that one ends up being your best choice for for road racing motorcycles uh you know, and, and kart racing you know fairly fairly close for second place there and those are the two that were were actively seeking some folks to come in and, and co-host you know some different things with specific information from that so so keep that in mind and uh and uh and that's kind of why we're why we're doing what we're doing but your votes there have been really super helpful in uh, in helping us understand where we want to continue to go with our co-hosting and, and 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 topics. Okay, Matt, you ready to for me to move on to the next one for you? Yeah, as you move on to that, I'm going to get a couple of people's questions because um, perfect. Greg asked about calculating Ackerman steering and comparing it versus the actual steering and and some of those things. It's a really great way you can you can really run a long way with that data and doing that math. Um, it's a little bit beyond what we're doing here. This is why I said this is kind of the quick and dirty way to do it, but but that's a great calculation to do and a great way to track things. Um, and to wrap it up, uh, David asked, just to clarify, it is, if you have more steering input with the same G-forces, the car's understeering because it's not giving you a reaction. Um, the same idea if you have less g-force with the same input the rear starting to slide the car is giving up and now it's oversteering um you covered a lot of books and certainly well. something um you know my info is going to be here at the end of this you can always email me get in touch with me i'm happy to to help you out and if, if you need some pictures or something kind of on your data i'm happy to to help everybody with that um and with the poll this also applies to um carts and everything else that you you do kind of minus dirt and boats and snow, because that's where that graph gets a little fuzzier, right? When you drive a powerboat in the water, it's not always on the rails the same. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Well, I've, I've, I've brought up Matt's third example. Now, the first, the first one was when folks use it quite a bit. The, the middle one was, hey, we're just showing you some, uh, some stuff that a lot of people are using. We always like to, you know, we, we try to always show you something that maybe, maybe you don't have a lot of, and maybe you don't, people don't have a, a big use for this right away, but uh, it, it's kind of a cool, cool thing and show you the power of what you guys are using here with the AIM software and the, and the AIM hardware. And, and uh, thought Matt would maybe show you a little bit of uh, something that's a little bit more uh, advanced. So go ahead and explain what we're looking at here, Matt. Yeah, I wanted to give everyone a, a shot at something a little more advanced. So what we have here is we have uh, our speed trace on the top, as, as we frequently do up here, and it gives us a point on the track. And then here we have a graph for each corner of the car, left front, top left, right front, top right, right rear to the top bottom right, left rear on the bottom left. And this is the tire pressure in my 914 across the lap. Um, one thing we see here, to, and, and we covered it before, we don't have our scale, right? We don't really know where it is. So in our measures graph over here, we can come in and yeah, select our graph and then turn on that scale. So now we know what the tire pressure was during the lap. Um, and while Matt's doing that, each one of these is individual uh, XY plots. It's what we talked about earlier by having multiple worksheets available. So he's having to click on each one of them because it's its own standalone little XY plot. He's had to turn on the scaling for each one of them. That's what he just did there. Yep. Now we see what the tire pressure was in that lap. And we're looking at tire pressure on the Y axis up and down, lateral G's left to right gives us an idea of one lap. And what's a really neat thing we can do when we have these tire pressures is we can come in and turn on multiple laps. What this lets us do now is look at tire pressure build 
during a session, right? Because we have all these laps on. So we see how it rises up and it goes, you know, here from about 32 to almost 37. Um, and we can look at it and say, where did this tire, what pressure did it make the most lateral grip? So a really cool thing when we're on asphalt is we can look at it and go, there's a shape to these curves on the outside, on the edges, as we look at them. If we look at, say, the um, left front, we see over here at about just under 33, it made more grip than when it was up here at 37. So now instead of guessing at our tire pressures or going by feel, we have some data to work with. Um, it gives us a chance we can track this across sessions and um, make a, learn a, really a whole bunch about our tires. Um, I like to use this data when I have it as sort of the idea of we could do shock sweeps or sway bar sweeps where we go from full soft to full hard. We can do that with our tires and go from low pressure to really high pressure. Um, see a couple questions about how do you get this? Um, sometimes you can get it from the OEM. I have a, a set of tire pressure sensors that I use with it, it's a little control box and some screw on ones or some that you can sell on the tire. Um, there's everything from kind of trailer grade stuff all the way to um, really high end McLaren style um, info. So the, the, the price range on it really varies quite a bit. Um, the system I work with ties right into the second can on an, the new aim loggers. Um, it's incredible how powerful those systems are that you can connect so many different devices on the CAN networks and get this sort of data. Um, the other neat part about this, you don't need super fast data. As you look at this, your tire pressures don't change really, really fast. They take a little bit as the tire warms up for that pressure to rise. So it's not something that you need every um, tenth of a second, every you know, you don't need 50 readings in a second. If you read once a second, it's plenty to get this sort of information. But it helps you kind of calibrate as a driver and it helps you um, really get to where you can use this data as a driver, sort of to engineer your car and to engineer yourself and how you can be a better driver. Pretty, pretty cool advanced way of looking at, uh, you know, just wanted to give you some XY plots and, and some ways of looking at something that was maybe a little out of the norm. And it was, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. As soon as we, you started to chat about it, the Q&A, you know, lit up. There's a, there's a lot of people that have a lot of interest in, 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 in maybe doing a, a little bit more. The only one I'll cover before we, before we start to close out was Mark talked about how are we understanding if that's the largest lateral G. But my eye, and this is Matt's data, I, I have not studied this, but it's kind of interesting. We've we've just lit up these four these four different laps, right? And we've used the per lap color function that's up here in the in the measures graph area per lap color. And what we've done is is we can see if you start to look at the orange one, generally speaking, it's got the highest, you know, general peaks. I mean, we would dig in a little bit more, a little bit higher this way, a little bit higher this way. It's higher than almost all the rest of them, right? And that's the the, the basic idea Matt's looking at here. And he'll dump, you know, dive in deeper and, and you know, to, to look at it more. But generally speaking, the orange, the magnitude of the higher Gs happened at this 32, 33 in the left front tire here, right? And on this one here, it was 32, you know, 32 and a half or or so on the average tire pressure. Uh, it, interesting to be able to pick that up. And then also, uh, the other thing that I see then when I first look at this real quickly is, is look at how tall the left front is from the bottom of the, uh, the orange, which happened to be the early lap, obviously. Tire pressures are going up as he's running to the height of the purple one. And look at that versus the, 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 the right front tire. There is more growth in the left front tire. So at some point, if you're trying to get to to 30, 36 on all of your tires, let's say that's a number that works uh, and you're trying to match on all four corners at the end or whatever, you can see what the growth is and, and your starting pressures can maybe even be adjusted by the what, what this is showing as well. Why is it so much higher on the left front, Matt, the, the, the growth? Well, as we look at a track like Watkins Glen, so if we just jump back maybe to our first profile here and we take a look at the track, um, the idea of track characteristics, Watkins Glen goes um, clockwise. Yeah, so as we look right at the track, course. we see it is primarily right-hand turns. So It'll when you're trying to tire. carry yeah. the speed into the corners, you're really up on that left front tire and you're, you're braking and turning and it puts all that pressure down there on the left front and tends to heat it up more and then it builds more pressure. 
Um, exactly, exactly. I'm gonna bring that back up. The uh, I'm gonna turn off a couple of these laps just for just to get us yeah. back where we can kind of close this out. I see one more question that we'll we'll jump on before we bail out to the to the presentation. We're pretty much cleaned them all up, but there was uh, one one question is and, and and I think it was Mike was talking about well. The correlation between tire temperature and pressure obviously that's uh, that would be the next step matt's got uh, some channels in here that uh, are on this car as well and by the way this data is going to be available to you if anybody writes uh, myself or matt uh, an email we'll, we'll zip up this data file and it'll be sent to you so it'll also be available in the uh, in a few days on a, on the youtube site there'll be a link to uh, to some of the different things we've shown here as well but matt has also has you know tire temperature data in it uh, it is showing the uh, the temperature i use that one profile that i saved early uh, that uh, that goes in here and shows the actual inside middle uh, inside inside middle outside of the two rear tires let's say in this particular case and it shows you know how, how the temperatures are changing and then you tie that together with with uh, with the with the, the the pressures from the the data that's in here as well and 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 maybe uh, everybody can start playing with it if you don't have those kind of sensors my email and Matt's email will be in a contact page here just very shortly. And a, a teaser for the people as well that, that want to play with the data a little bit is when you jump into this data, it also has, um, along with the tire pressures, it has uh, air temp for the tires as well. <laughs> you can see that here in um, the TPMS temperature, left front, right front, left rear, air right temperature. rear. So it has the air temp in there. So if, if you're a football fan at all, I'm in New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> you listen, if you remember the whole deflate gate thing with Tom Brady and the Patriots, here is your, your, all the math you need to do the formula. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm I going to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that alone there. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring up an, an uh, another, poll on our on our way kind of out we've we've got just a couple more questions or maybe we'll look at them as we as we uh, as we go so i'm going to launch one more poll and it's uh future webinar topics this has been this has been super helpful to to us as we've been going and uh, we'll probably adjust some of these names uh you know some of these things as we start to look back and get a, a really good understanding of what people have been saying so but they're pretty much as they've been uh, in the past so go ahead and and pick your top three if um uh, I, I did adjust it a little bit. Select the top three topics you'd like to see in future AIM, AIM Sports Learn Fast webinars. It's a multiple choice, but uh, if you can limit it down to year three, that would be that would be great. While you're doing that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the to the to the presentation. We'll jump ahead um, and answer. Oops. Well, uh, I'm sorry, we didn't show that one before. Uh, any. Um, any questions and answers, Matt, that you uh, that you see there that while we're finishing up that poll, you can you can drop through fairly quickly. Yeah, Bruce asked about um, tire temps versus tire pressure for optimal grip. There, um, the ultimate totally question, right? <laughs> car, track, day dependent, and um, corner of the car. Yeah, really corner. Like uh, as you really dig into tire pressure data, you can find depending on the track, it will change for each corner of the car. Um, to get really deep into it, I've set up monitors where I monitor the asphalt temperature at a track through a whole weekend. And as the track temp changes, the optimal temp for the tire kind of changes and how it grows. So it, it gets super involved really quick. It's, um, I told someone it's about a six month rabbit hole that you can dig into there if you really <laughs> get into it. But um, for folks that want to take a look, this data set is really great because it has all those really advanced things in it that you can play with and, and check out to see what you get. Perfect. Is there a document that describes turning the multiple data plot feature, multiple worksheets? Uh, there, uh, uh, right now, I, I have chatted about this in, uh, in, in other videos. I don't have it on top of my head where, where those are, but uh, we will, uh, Greg, I think if you, if you drop me a note, uh, I'll, I'll get you an answer to that directly. And for everybody else, uh, we will have that in one of the upcoming webinars we're going to talk about that user interface and some more advanced type and in within a few weeks we'll, we'll we will chat about that specifically so um okay and and matt why did you grow your hair out is it a uh, is it a, <laughs> is it a pandemic thing or what uh, what's going on there as a as no a, it, it um chat about that one it started before pri um uh, in a joke with my seven-year-old son i said i should grow my hair out like yours and both kids said i should do it so 
Here it's coming. <laughs> there it's on its way, right? Yeah. Uh, I shared the poll results from the from the top three, and you notice that uh, data analysis. That's the one I think we better, we'll change this poll up a little bit or add a second one where we uh, where we jump in a little bit more into uh, into data analysis uh, topics, you know, in, individual ones, and we'll talk about that. Track maps coming directly up uh, as in in the second place. The uh, I have made a. Uh, w I'm looking up here at a, at a whiteboard. I think we're going to talk all about track maps on uh, on May 7th. Uh, we typically don't put out uh, the the uh, the schedule, but we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to have a whole a whole webinar on track maps and you know GPS maps versus the internal you know segmenting maps and then the maps that are in uh, you know you load onto your Smarty Cam and stuff like that. So those uh, for those of you who've been asking for track maps, we've been hearing you and uh, we have adjusted the schedule. So I think in uh, in the next two or three, you're going to have a, a track map webinar directly. So perfect. Uh, the next one, uh, the next panel that we have here, let me get ahead and get that out of your way so you can, uh, we can move on. A little bit in, as we kind of close this out, training and support. We're, we're, we're certainly doing these webinars. We're going to continue to do these. We just love, love uh, sharing this information and having some great co-hosts like Matt and uh, and at the end of this one, within uh, within a couple of hours, the you know this this recording will be up on on our on our Learn Fast e training video YouTube site. Uh, so all of these are jumping up there, and we're we're building in some links where we're taking these questions and answers that some of them were answered. Certainly, the guys from from uh, my, my cohorts here at AIM have been just going crazy and uh, and answering questions in there. Some of you may not have been able to focus on that, which is which uh, is, I think is the right thing to do. Focus on the presentation. Then we're taking those uh, those Q and A's, the answers and the questions that, uh, that were provided, and we're putting those into a document, and they will be linked. It, it can't be done in real time. So if you check back on some of the older uh, uh, webinars as we as we get the questions and answers done, they will be linked in the description box in the YouTube in the in the YouTube stuff. So that will uh, be available too. And we have you know. 60, 70 other videos that are out there talking about uh, all, all sorts of different things, uh, all sorts of functionality, and, and all, of course, all these webinars and previous webinars and, and stuff is on our uh, YouTube site. So go visit that and take a look at uh, not only the webinars, but uh, other ones that we're doing as well. So the, um, you know, AIM is, uh, uh, the way I like to say it is, is AIM is a, uh, is, is a customer support company that happens to sell electronics, right? So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're just, you anxious to get back out to the track and, and, and see all of our friends and all of our, all of our customers that we, we love to support so much and, and, uh, and hopefully, hopefully soon. But meanwhile, give us a call if you have any questions at the 800 number and, uh, and, 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 and chat with us. We're, we're more than happy to, to, to do anything we can to help. So the, um, the next webinar, Matt did a pre preview there a couple times. So uh, the, uh, the, the next one we're going to talk about based on, 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 uh, information that we've been getting from these polls and from emails that we get is, uh, is going to be, uh, is, is going to be, oops, it's, uh, it's Thursday. Uh, I missed on that slide. Thursday, April 30th, two days away. Jeremy Lucas from Fast Tech is going to come back and, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, and focus on breaking analysis using GPS based channels. So if you got a solo or you know, almost all of our devices now, obviously they have, you know, GPS sensors built in. So, um, but certainly solos, uh, you know, the, a large percentage of our users are using solo devices. We're going to talk about how to understand your braking and how to analyze that in a much deeper way with some, with not only those, you know, GPS you know, lateral and longitudinal, you know, base sensors, but also with some math channels that uh, Jeremy's going to talk about and, and, and show you how to do. And then of course we'll share, share the data and share the math channels when it's all said and done as well. So looking forward to that one in a couple of days with, uh, with Jeremy. Uh, kind of as a closing slide, we've got our contact information. The uh, Matt has come on here and, and just done a fantastic job. He's going to be doing another one here, here coming up soon and, and, and maybe a couple more probably. Uh, here's the contact information, my information, my email, Matt's information and, and, and his email. The uh, in, Any questions you might have, uh, shoot it to Matt and I, uh, and the data, you know, if you want the data, if you want to chat a little bit about some of the different things that we've done, make sure you give us a, give us a holler. So. With that, I think we're uh, we're about done. Matt, do you have anything else that you'd like to add on, on the, as we close this out? No, I, I know for some people that just started to scratch the itch. So any questions or anything, feel free to shoot me an email, um, get in touch, and, and I'll help you out any way I can. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Matt. I know it takes a lot of work to, to, to get prepared for one of these, and, and you did a fantastic job as usual, as, as the rest of our co-hosts have done as well. These are super valuable for everybody that's out there and attending, and I, and, uh, and I appreciate all the extra work you guys are doing. Thanks to all of our AIM guys that are out there that have, uh, have answered questions like crazy. I was watching the questions and answers, and they were popping up and, and, and leaving, so those guys, uh, those guys are, uh, need to rest their fingers a little bit as well. So uh, thank you, everybody. We uh, look forward to seeing you next Thursday with Jeremy and uh, and we'll see you at the next one.